Okay, I think we can get started. Um, thank you for, for joining us. Um, sorry, if there's some, some beeping sounds. Uh, I really appreciate everybody joining us today for this overview, uh, an update of the Village Health Works Kikutu Hospital Women's Health uh, Pavilion update. Um, we've been working on this project for many years. We're finally starting to see the finish line on this. And uh, a lot of people on this call have been instrumental to guiding us, supporting us, um, and, and helping us get to where we need to be. So um, I see a lot of familiar faces on here. I wish I could talk to each one of you and thank you individually, but, um, but we really do appreciate everything that you all have done to help us get to where we are. Um, on the call today are um, three people that I have tremendous respect for. Um, one who you're probably very familiar with is Deo, who I see on my screen, uh, Village Health Works founder and CEO. Um, I don't know if he needs much of an introduction with this group, but Deo has been part of Village Health Works since the start. Um, his story is told in Tracy Kidder's Strength and What Remains, and that book ends with Village Health Works starting and continues to this day. Um, so I'll, I guess we'll leave it there. I think everybody knows Deo's story. Um, after Deo will be speaking, we have Ron Kotzer. Ron is our Director of Capital Projects. Ron has about 25 years, if not more, of experience in construction and project management. Um, he's been with Village Health Works for around two, two and a half years. Um, he's worked in Africa, the Middle East, um, and has been instrumental in guiding this project, making sure on a daily basis, almost seven days a week, that this thing gets done. So um, I'm excited to introduce you all to Ron. And then Teresa Gibson, Dr. Teresa Gibson, is our Director of Clinical Quality and Training. Uh, she's also serving as the Interim Medical Director, uh, Chief Medical Officer, sorry. Uh, she's got 30 years of clinical experience graduating from Georgetown. Um, she's, I think what's most impressive about Teresa is she's worked in almost every position at a hospital, ranging from phlebotomist to nurse to physician. So I think when you'd work with her and talk to her, she's got a deep understanding of how a hospital works. And she's bringing that expertise to helping to make sure that this hospital is ready to open this year, that it's operationalized um, and we're ready to go and start, start, start moving um, towards the end of the year. Um, so, uh, with that, I think each and one individually can, can give you anything I, I missed. But before we jump in, uh, just a reminder, please put yourselves on mute. Um, that would be great. We can hear some background noises. There will be an opportunity for questions towards the end. Um, we're hoping to, to talk for 30 minutes to leave a little bit of time at the end so that you guys can ask some questions. Um, and with that, I will leave it uh, with Dale. So thank you guys very much. Uh, thank you so very much, Wade. Uh, hi, everyone. Let me start by thanking all of you for joining us today. It really means a lot to me personally, our team at Village Health Works and uh, our community we serve in Burundi. Uh, most of you, uh, uh, next slide, Wade, please. Yeah, most of you, uh, if not all of uh, all of you, actually, um, I see a number of names here uh, that have been to people who have been to Burundi, uh, and even those who, have, those who have not, you know the history of Village Health Works. But I thought it may be a good idea to show you some pictures of where we started and how the campus has grown since then. Uh, the picture to your left was uh, taken by a uh, Google Earth uh, in 2005, and that shows Kigo to where we are. You can see a red dot, it says Village Health Works. That is exactly where we started in 2006. It looks like <laughs> You know, first, this is a community, like many communities in Burundi, that has suffered a lot during the war. And it looks like uh, there were no people there, but there were thousands and thousands of people, and yet they were invisible. This is just not Kigutu, but an example of what a rural area in Burundi, where most of Burundians live as subsistence farmers, who have uh, really no access to health care. This is where they live. They are therefore the neediest, and that's why we are in this rural area of Burundi. 
one of the poorest in the country. And yet, uh, I must say, again, those who have been to Burundi, they took a good to, they know this place, one of the most beautiful places. Uh, to the right, you can see now our campus. Uh, this picture actually has been taken, uh, I think, maybe a year or so. Yeah, this is 2021, but it has changed uh, quite a lot. Uh, so where, what, what do we say about healthcare in Burundi? It's, next, next, next slide, please. First, Burundi today has a population of about uh, 12 million people. And uh, when you think about healthcare, focusing on one area, maternal health, it's one of the highest maternal mortality rate in the world more than twice as high as neighboring Rwanda and 27 times higher than in the US. Burundi has a number of positions, many of them are in the Western world, uh, but those who are in Burundi are uh, uh, 1,200 doctors and 70%, imagine 70% are in the city of Bujumbura, which used to be the capital, and even at those of 30% left, they are in some cities in other provinces, not in rural areas where we have 90% of Burundians in those areas who are subsistence farmers. So when people talk about healthcare in Burundi, where most people have no access to, uh, to care, we can imagine how dire you know, the situation is. And again, this says a lot about uh, uh, why village health works is where it is. And also when we talk about the hospital, we talk, a lot of people have asked, oh, this is too big, this is too much, but we should be, we should be actually thinking about uh, in our community of 200,000, which is almost, if not more, the population of Cambridge, Massachusetts, which has uh, Harvard, which has Brigham and women, so many hospitals, teaching hospitals over there. So it's, we should be probably talking about 10 times more than the size of uh, the hospital we've been talking about. Where do these people go when they need, for example, surgery? They go to this uh, hospital. I took personally this picture in 2006, summer 2006, when I was visiting hospitals in Burundi. And this um, was the only uh, operating room that was available for hundreds of uh, uh, thousands of people who, uh, if they needed a surgery or C-section, that's exactly where they would go. This hospital was, uh, uh, is in Romongi Hospital and was built in 1949 during colonial times. And when you go there, you just wonder is what is this really? You, you can't just uh, even uh, afford to spend a minute over there. Uh, it's, uh, it's what it is. It's uh, self-explanatory, I don't have to say much. And so it's, uh, uh, look at where Rwanda, our uh, sister um, country, uh, we, we are really one country. Um, divided by common language and Rwanda has been quite uh, um, moving a lot of, pro making a lot of progress in Burundi. Uh, we, uh, but Burundi has uh, stayed behind simply because uh, he has not uh, been able to attract uh, uh, people who can help as much as uh, they helped Rwanda. But uh, again, this is another reason to believe that uh, in a situation like this, you can change things, not natural disaster. It's what people can do to uh, where it has been lost. Um, next slide, wait, please. You see these community members here? We talked, we wouldn't be where we are without our community members. We had no money, we had, uh, we knew what we were suffering from, we knew all the problems. Uh, and so where do we begin? We had to rely on those community members in those rural areas. Let's do something about 
our health challenges. Uh, they donated the land, this is the land, this is in Kigwe too. And we waited, I started talking about uh, this hospital since 2008. And uh, here we are in 2022. Finally, we are heading somewhere, we show you some pictures. But community members were losing family members and waiting and waiting and waiting. This picture was taken in October of 2013. And they had started digging. Basically, they came and they said, listen, we know money is an issue. We know there are a lot of challenges, but we have a hose and we can start digging. We will build it our own way. The picture to the right is uh, a picture taken by some of our colleagues. We are holding meetings with the community members, begging them to stop, to really stop destroying this site because we were busy with uh, different architects uh, to look into where you know we can build it, looking at the soil and so on and so forth. It was a, such a challenge really to stop them. And that said a lot about community participation and how badly they needed at this hospital. So we managed to say, well, just bear with us. We're really working very hard on it. Friends in the United States and different places are working very hard, but it was not easy. As you can see on this picture, most of the people who are there are women. And so when we talk about maternal health, it's not because it's what everyone is talking, it's exactly what we have been seeing, mothers dying in childbirth and uh, leaving often children behind who have no future, no hope when they don't have uh, a parent around. So it's something that has affected this community and the country in general. So they were not just showing up to just do something that really because they thought, okay, this is an opportunity for us to really make a difference and uh, save, start saving lives. Next, please. Finally, finally, after all these years, this is uh, uh, the first picture uh, was taken in 2018. And we have started uh, moving really as much as we could with uh, everyone as a help who has made uh, uh, incredible generous contribution to make sure that we get this hospital built and so that it can be used to save lives. But as you know, um, COVID came and it affected the, uh, the entire world. In this situation, almost all uh, construction materials we, we use uh, come from outside. So supply chain got disrupted but we didn't stop. We used whatever was available as we wait for uh, some materials to get there. And finally, we, we are getting quite a lot of uh, uh, materials. Just uh, last month, we had the containers that came from the UK and uh, really with the, also the support of the government, uh, we used to have all these shipments stay first at the customs but we have an agreement from the government of Burundi to get all the international shipments straight to the site without going through the customs first. So you see, the, even the government has been paying attention and the community and everyone really trying to help in every possible way. Today, this is what this hospital looks like. Uh, it's a 150 bed hospital. And again, it's uh, not too big. It's uh, you know, for a population of 200,000 people. And we are seeing even people coming not only from over Burundi, but also from across the lake, Congo, and some neighboring Tanzania. Uh, but we are starting in this uh, once completed, it's going to save so many, many, many lives. And that's really about health equity and justice that we have been talking about. Uh, next slide, please. We have, as of today, just a, a few minutes ago, um, just 105 days left for this hospital to be completed. Uh, on June 1st, we expect Ron, who's going to be speaking with you uh, shortly, to give the keys to Dr. Teresa and her clinical team 
so that they can open and start uh, looking at the flow of patients in the hospital, in the equipment and all of that. Uh, I cannot thank you enough. We would not be at all where we are today or even a closer without everyone who has been really keeping faith in us and supporting in every possible way. And this hospital is uh, really going to be the pride of Burundi and the pride of everyone who's going to be working in it and uh, everyone who's going to be using it, um, whether it's the patient or uh, the staff working there. We have been extremely, extremely lucky to um, uh, get more friends joining us. Just the you can see the numbers. 22 million US dollars, 300,000 US dollars uh, needed for this hospital, 92% uh, already completed. Just last year, we uh, were able to raise 5 million US dollars. Board members jumped in and really, really, really did a fantastic job to uh, bring in a new friends. Uh, so it just really to give you an update of how things are um, over there and where we are at with this project. And we really cannot wait for the day we are going to open and all of you uh, who are here and uh, who are and others who are not able to join us, you are very, very, very welcome to come to the opening and to see the place and to see this building that we've been talking about for a number of years now. Uh, so let me leave the floor to uh, Ron, who is running this, uh, uh, building this hospital, so that he can tell you more and show you where, where we are at uh, uh, today and the future, you know, progress. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dave. Um, next slide, wait, okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, and I'm glad I can present this to, to so many people and, and people that are really influential to our cause and to get this put forward. Um, as they has mentioned, we've had some challenges and obviously the weather is also not doing us any favors in the rainy season. But nevertheless, um, December last year, you can see where we were. We were busy with the retaining walls. Um, and this is on the, the, IC, the side of the ICU on the eastern side. Uh, and you can see the paving that has gone in and there was a previous slide that was also shown on the paving and then January 22, that's that's basically where we're at. Um, we've also started landscaping um, so that at least when we do, do touch base in, in June, um, you know, it will look like just not a, a, a pimple on, on, a, on a landscape, but it will be properly landscaped and, and properly foliage around it. Next slide, please uh, wait. Now, this gives you more or less an idea of, uh, um, you know, the, the work and, and, and the struggle that it's been. You must understand or appreciate, and I'm sure you do, that this is quite a remote, remote construction area. You haven't got the luxuries of a ready mixed plant or concrete pumps really available or a proper scaffolding or support, support system in place. And we had to make do with what we got. And, and just to put it in perspective, the concrete that's gone into this building just on the roof sections, uh, took the guys 22,000 wheelbarrows. It's just over 22,000 wheelbarrows of concrete that has gone in. And you can see we started dismantling the ramp, um, the ramp on the left-hand side. That was a ramp that the guys had the concrete wheelbarrowed up to cast the slab on that main entrance foyer. And on the right-hand side, you can see the main entrance foyer is already done. Um, we started landscaping, as I said earlier on, and the paving has gone in. And and yeah, we we done the down the straight, we down the last couple of meters to, to get this thing pushed over the, the line. Next slide, please, Wayne. Again, um, the progress is quite progressing quite well inside. We, we um, as they mentioned, we've received a container and in the container was a lot of our second fix items um, especially on the MEP, the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. Uh, we've got most of those items on site now. Uh, they were released last month. Um, and thank goodness they have pushed to get this, the, the, the customs clearing the stuff on the site itself. Uh, you can see the flooring is done. It's just been, it's, it's, it's covered 
as a protective layer, they still need to come and do the final polish on both the floors. So that gives you an idea. You can see the slide on the right hand side with the pediatric ward, the skylight, the effect that it will have, um, you know, the natural light that's coming into this into this whole building and into the into the wards. Next slide, please, uh, Wade. Again, as I said, by June last year, um, these delivery rooms were, were in progress. And you can see the slide on the right hand side. We basically there. Um, those cutouts are for the diffusers for the for the HVAC, um, the mechanical ventilation, and the other square ones are for for some of the lights. And you'll see against the wall, we've already got the gas piping going in. Um, Seventy percent of the gas piping has been installed, so the progress is going quite well. Again, the floor needs a final polish or final a final rub down and then a polish, um, but the things are going well and they're progressing well. Next slide, please. Wait. Yeah, this is also the mechanical, electric, and plumbing section. Um, the slide on the left hand side, for interest sake, uh, that whole switchgear mechanism that you see there, we actually had to break a door opening and take a door frame out and split that unit in two to be able to fit it into the building. Um, yeah, that's just one of those things that do happen. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see we've received the last lot of our boilers um, or the hot water system. Um, we still need a bit of a push on getting the solar panels installed on the roof, but that's in, in progress at the moment. And the, 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 the water tank, you can see in the background, there's a 6,000 liter water tank that will feed, um, feed the hospital. And um, we have, do have two backup tanks on the southern quadrant to feed into this. Um, in case there are some some breakages in the line or the feeder line to the to the hospital itself. Next slide, please, Wade. Mm. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, Ron. Um, good morning, everybody, or maybe afternoon where you are. Um, my, again, my name is Teresa Gibson. I'm a family physician um, and working as the um, interim chief medical officer and the director of clinical quality and training for Village Health Works. Um, so it's been a really exciting um, learning curve for me to learn all about Village Health Works um, and to jump into this incredible project that's going on. Um, I just wanna echo what everyone else has said. It's just, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to talk to um, some of our supporters um, and um, welcome any of the questions that you may have at the end of the presentation. So I'm just going to go over a little bit about kind of some of the activities that I've been involved in um, and where we are and, and uh, where we need to be. So um, the first is I'll just say part of my job in terms of the clinical quality and training is to really understand what, what does training look like and what does that quality look like in the, in the Burundian context? So I've, I've worked in Malawi and Kenya and Zambia um, and Tanzania and, and other places and, and uh, as well as in Latin America. But I, I wanted to take an opportunity to go in to visit um, some other sites. So um, just three weeks ago, I had a chance to take a team of the IT person, facilities, the, the head nurse, one of the other physicians in the lab, and we went to visit two hospitals, which was I, just inspirational and um, also just a wonderful opportunity to look at what kinds of training external training opportunities might be able to, to be available to us and what kinds of um, partnerships that we might have. So we visited two hospitals. Very different. Kibuye Hospital is a, a mission slash um, Ministry of Health district level hospital, it has about 350 beds. Uh, the mission hospital was founded in 1945. Um, and so they have a long history of care for Burundians in resource challenged areas. Um, it was great to see the work that they do. Um, they have surgery, which is you know, obviously something that we're going to be doing and just to have a chance to talk to them about some of the challenges that they've faced in doing that and, and also their successes. Um, they've just completed a pediatric ward. They've got some great um, um, innovation around technology from you know, making the incubators for babies themselves and beds and you know, just a lot of different things. So that was wonderful and it was great for the team to actually to see 
um, that hospital in action uh, for facilities to be able to go to sterilization to look at um, their um, hygiene practices and, and all of those things that, that are important operational pieces in terms of the hospital. We also had uh, a chance then to go to Cura Hospital, which is a, probably, I would say, is probably one of the best private hospitals in Burundi, um, which is a collaboration between the uh, a Swiss or organization and um, an insurance company um, in Burundi. And so beautiful private hospital um, with uh, all sorts of specialty consultants, surgery and ICU emergency room. So many of the things that we aspire to do in our work. Um, and so again, a, a wonderful opportunity for our staff to, to see that in action and to create some relationships so that they can go back and spend more time in that hospital. Um, so for instance, we, we found out that the hygiene at that private hospital in Bujumbura is done by a contracted um, cleaning company, not something that we had really thought about. Um, and, you know, to understand what their guidelines are and their training and those things, which are things that we will need to do in order to, to um, provide that kind of quality in the hospital where we are. So the next slide, please. Part of the other work that I've been doing um, is to really do an assessment of the physicians, the nurses, and the departments that are within the clinical enterprise. So um, we've done these, it's been a, a combination of some uh, kind of a mixed methods, um, data collection, having inter individual conversations um, with each of the providers, trying to understand where they wanna be, what they feel that their strengths are, what are their areas of challenge, and also to be able to complete like a skills list so that we really understand where their proficiencies are and, and where are the areas where they need to strengthening. We've done the same thing with the nurses. Um, again, face-to-face -face interviews with them. And, you know, overall, what I would say is that, you know, we have, you know, for physicians and nurses, a fairly well-educated group of people. I think the uh, challenge is really, I, I think, in terms of their experience and particularly in their experience related to a higher acuity um, patient load. So we're really focusing kind of our training plan, which will be a combination of some on online programs, kind of authentic bedside teaching with clinical mentors, internal trainings, uh, doing more orientation as we hire new people, and then an opportunity for them to actually go and spend some time in some of these other hospitals that we're visiting, and as well as I've identified several places in the region um, that where people could go to do training in things like neonatal, um, uh, the nursery, which is not something that we've done, and so we really need nurses with those skill sets. Um, uh, to be able to provide the, the level of, of, uh, of services that we're, that we're looking for. Next slide, please. So in terms of staff training, I've talked a little bit about that. We've had the opportunity to have um, several people come and visit and to do trainings. Uh, on the left is uh, uh, Patrick McCarthy, who's an emergency room doctor with a, uh, who's done an ultrasound fellowship, really focused on point of service um, ultrasound. And so he's training with uh, Dr. Jean-Baptiste, who's our medical director. Um, and so we're as we're thinking about this training, we're also thinking about what our recruitment needs are because it's very difficult to find um, residency trained um, physicians or um, high acuity level nurses um, in, in, in Burundi. So we kind of have a three tiered um, strategy that we're using. And, you know, uh, one part of that is to, to recruit senior um, physicians and nurses who are residency trained, most of whom will be expats, and then junior um, physicians and nurses who uh, may be more regional uh, and have some expertise, um, not because they've done a specific residency per se or a specific nursing train training in something like neonatal care, but have worked in those areas in uh, district and provincial referral level hospitals. And then the, the third tier is really our general practitioners and our staff nurses. You know, we have quite a bit of, of recruitment um, to do. We'll have uh, a total of about 37 um, physicians. Right now we have seven. So that's a big number of people to, re to recruit. Um, and the same thing with nurses. We have 22 nurses and we'll need um, probably around 70 in order to staff the hospital. Next slide, please. 
So a fun part for me um, is uh, hearing Ron talk about how much closer he is to having the building being finished and thinking about um, how we're really gonna utilize this space. So one of the tasks that I've been doing is to actually go by, go into the hospital and kind of room by room, really think about the functionality of the, of the building, um, where, where are the cabinets, where are the shelves, where are the, where's the storage, um, where will the doctors sleep when they're on call, where are the nurses stations, um, how do patients flow through the, through the building. Um, and so that's one part of it. Um, and then the other part, which is, is, I think for me, the more fun part is really thinking about what is the building going to look like? Like when you walk in, what is it going to feel like to walk yeah, into to me, you know. Kigutu Hospital to the w Women's Health Pavilion? And, you know, we, we talk a lot about treating our patients with dignity and respect and compassion. And so what does it look like to be in that kind of environment, um, to have a place that feels comfortable, um, and, and yet is really functional and also where people feel comfortable in the sense of, is it kind of culturally appropriate in terms of the design, the pictures that are on the walls, the colors that are there, you know, all of those pieces. So um, we are um, steadily um, going through each of those rooms and um, we are going to, in kind of more um, of a, a more, specific way um, forming a committee um, that will be working with us to look at the interior design of the spaces um, and the uh, artwork and other things that will happen so that we'll be able to, to start moving towards that, um, towards that goal. So the next slide, please. Um, and then, you know, Ron, I showed you some of these pictures is just kind of incredible. Um, and I wanted to just overview just a little bit about kind of where we are in terms of kind of operations um, and where we're going. So next slide, please. So I just wanna go over this briefly. So, um, you know, we're still in this phase one period of time. And then the phase one period of time is really about getting the building done, doing a lot of the planning that I've talked to you about. It's not just the planning for the interior of the building, it's the planning of who's going to be in the inside of the building. What are the services that we're going to be um, providing uh, what is the equipment that we need? So we're in process uh, across that full spectrum of really looking at every single piece that needs to happen for us to open, to open safely, to have the staff that we need and to be able to move forward. In you know, kind of phase two of that um, process um, is when we're really going to planning construction will be done, we'll begin our services. Um, we've developed, I've developed um, detailed service packages for each of the departments. So emergency, um, women's healthcare, pediatrics, et cetera, to really um, understand exactly what services that we're providing and, and that that's helping us to, to do our planning. Um, as you all know, we'll be providing emergency obstetrical care. We've got four operating rooms. Um, which means we need obstetricians, we need anesthesia folks, we need nurses who can who can manage uh, complicated patients and 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 complicated babies. Uh, so all of those things are are in process, and you know we'll really continue to be working on that kind of essential clinical care uh, throughout the lifespan of this of this uh, of this institution. And then in phase three is really more specialized clinical care. So we hope once we kind of settle ourselves down, the hospital has been open, you know, about a year or so, we really will be making an assessment of who are the patients that we're still referring out? Where are they going? What other skill sets do we need to bring in to be able to um, meet the needs of our, of our clients? And then phase four is really more training and education. And so kind of put it dotted lines or along there because we're doing that already. So we'll do, we're doing that already, but the next level will really be to provide education and training programs um, to other uh, institutions, the Ministry of Health, to be able to bring nursing students, medical students, and um, to develop a, a robust uh, clinical uh, training program and, and research. And then of course, phase five is replication. And I'll let Deo um, uh, chime in on that at some future date, because um, I know he has big plans for, wh for what could be next. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, and I'm open to any questions that people may have. 
Great. Thank you, uh, Deo, Ron, and Teresa. And uh, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. Yeah, we do have uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, hope this was uh, informative. But if there's anything you want to dig into, um, I know we also have our operations manager our director on the call. Uh, so there's some other people that can chime in if there's other questions. But please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask questions. You can Julia. also put them in the chat. Sorry. Hi. Uh, oh, sorry. No, uh, for you. Okay. Hi. Well, first of all, um, Wade, thank you so much for hosting this. Uh, Deo, it's great to see you. I'm with the Schooner Foundation. And Teresa, um, what a pleasure to, uh, to meet you and hear from you. This is really helpful in terms of such a comprehensive overview, in terms of how you're thinking about staffing and training. A couple of questions that came up for me is, how are you thinking about technology, medical healthcare record systems, and um, and sort of it? And again, doesn't have to be answered on this call. Maybe highlighted, and then Wade can point me offline to to understand that at a deeper level. I was thinking about pharmacy on site, supply supply chain issues, and in the future, how much of this hospital do you see funded by the government um, versus sort of as a private hospital? So also thinking about um, medical insurance, um, you know, sort of uh, just some questions around, around that. I know some of some other um, healthcare partners with centers of excellence have thought about that with their communities. So I'd love to just briefly, if you would just touch on some of those things. Sure. Well, let me take the question about the technology, um, because that's something that we've been working on. So we've hired a um, information technology uh, chief of information technology um, in our system. He's a guy who has about 30 years of experience. Um, he actually is one of the um, uh, engineers of the of the rollout of Epic in the United States for the Providence system. So he worked here in Portland, Oregon. Um, he's from Kenya, and so he's been really great in terms of really understanding what um, we need to do and what's kind of technologically appropriate. Um, he spent a lot of time talking to each of the departments, really trying to understand what they need in terms of like lab and pharmacy, nursing, physicians. Um, how we how we tie into the community health workers, etc. So so we, he actually has just finished a, a request for proposals for a new electronic health record system. Um, and in addition to that, we're um, in conversations with the folks from Iheza and TIP um, to talk about talking about digital decision making tools that could be used at both the health center level and at the community. So really trying to think about this more holistically. You know, how do we get information at that community level back into our system? Because we tend to be really good at training people to do stuff in the community, but then it's like an information void. We never get that. We never get that back to us and particularly to the clinicians. So um, we're really excited. Uh, you know, everyone has a cell phone. I mean, we're living in such a new era, right? And so to really think deeply about how can we incorporate um, that that information technology into the systems, you know, from the beginning as we're rolling out the hospital. Um, I think I'm gonna leave the funding question to someone else because maybe who can answer that better than myself. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, uh, Julia. Good to see you. Um, and thank you so much, Teresa. In terms of uh, two things, I think you asked about the government, the role of the government in Burundi, uh, and also uh, health insurance, if I got these correctly. Uh, number one, <clears throat> as you know or may know, uh, Burundi has suffered tremendously for decades of uh, war, similar to the one in Rwanda. The difference between Burundi and Rwanda, Rwanda the war ended quickly and Rwanda had tremendous help from the international community. And Rwanda really also took advantage of that kind of support and started really focusing on healthcare, uh, not just uh, people giving money, but also training healthcare providers. So, the, the, you know, the idea was so successful that let's import the brains, bring the brains to Rwanda and train as many Rwandans as we can right there. 
we have an example, even still going on, we have the example of the University for Global Health Equity um, in Rwanda that uh, Parents in Health uh, built. Some of uh, our friends here, like Dr. Uh, Fred Sengo is here, know, is teaching there, knows all about that. So Burundi is not yet there. It is uh, extremely poor. It's one of the poorest uh, on earth, stays that way, but um, just to have the, not only the blessing from the government, but to tell us, listen, every Burundian, wherever you are, if you can, you have a friend, please come and support. This is a, this is a dire. So when I like to say, when the government is not getting in a way, it is a, a huge help. And you know what I mean? We know the world has a lot of problems, not just Burundi, it's not just Africa. We have a lot of problems right here. So that is incredibly helpful for us. There is a hardly a month that goes by without it. seeing some government official high up talking about video networks as a model, even though we have a long way to go, which frankly somehow is embarrassing because we know exactly where we should be and what we should be doing and to be praised like that. What it means is that, well, it's worse than what we thought actually uh, it is today. And yet there is this uh, enthusiasm, there's a burning desire. I think um, when, uh, I met with the president after meeting with the president last year for almost five hours. We talked nothing else about what can we do to strengthen healthcare systems. Or he said even his wife came out who has been, you know, she was not invited in the conversation, but she somehow joined us. Hey, are there people who can train nurses and who can train this and blah, 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 blah. We can, uh, you know, we, we we, we can go and talk to them. So it's, um, it's, it's really more complicated as to the way I see it, it's not just money because uh, in so many places money can get there, but wasted, burnt. And we've seen that unfortunately in so many places, including, including Burundi where people really show up and they actually don't know what the needs of the countries are, what the needs of the communities are. And so asking what the real needs are is so important. And then you really work closely with community members and government officials, you know, donating a land. It's not, you know, an easy thing in a country where people depend on, on, the, on the, uh, growing food. When you have uh, uh, permission from the government, easy peasy, you know, road being maintained, that kind of stuff, electricity. We have a lot of challenges, but uh, they still talk a lot about it. Even just last week, the Minister of Energy was talking about the urgent needs for power at Village Health Works. So we, we have enjoyed that kind of support from the government, but frankly, expecting money from the government of Burundi today or tomorrow would be unrealistic because they are really struggling. What is different today from yesterday in the government of Burundi, we have now a president who is really talking a lot about investing in healthcare, investing in education, economic development program, fight corruption, like tooth and nail. There's nothing else he talks about about that. Uh, so that gives us so much hope and we can all use the synergy from the government and the international community, get together and uh, uplift a country that has been neglected for so long. In terms of uh, health insurance, this is another thing that used to exist in Burundi back when I was in Burundi, can't believe it's uh, almost now 30 years. There were these uh, things called Mitchell public mutual insurance uh, uh, cards that actually um, now exist in Rwanda. Uh, people pay just something less than a dollar and uh, it really is a small amount of money, but it really makes a huge difference, even though it's, it's small. So uh, we've been talking about all these and the government has been talking about resuming that uh, system, which was very helpful. And um, 
uh, and we'll see, we'll see how that goes. So we are really in this stage with this uh, hospital being built where we can sit down with the government uh, officials and others and share our thoughts based on the patients who are seeing, based on the vision, the mission, and see what we can come up with together. And I love this uh, spirit of working together, you know, looking into issues for funding. How do you keep the village works running? How do you even grow? What are the opportunities available within the country? Um, I was uh, listening to uh, some people, this idea and others. They are really talking a lot about localization of resources. You know, what is going on in the countries like, like Burundi? And who are there? What is happening? So a lot of NGOs, um, um, foundations, uh, including UN agencies, are pumping a lot of money in the countries, uh, uh, in local uh, countries where people are working. We have also uh, some good news. The European Union now has lifted the, the economic embargo on Burundi because of uh, hope and improvement in governance. And those uh, um, international communities coming in, they are coming in with the support uh, projects like the village health works uh, institutions and supporting the government. So um, that's all I can really tell you uh, right now. It's a really an excellent question. We ask ourselves those same questions every single day. <laughs> but, uh, um, but you know, no matter what, we will never stop reaching out to friends. Uh, just the same way Harvard University that started in 30, 1636 is still reaching out to alumni who <laughs> there. All right. Uh, Fred, comparison, Dale. Dale. So, Fred? Dale, this is Fred Sinkor. I'm a physician out in California and I uh, had the, you know, obviously the great pleasure of spending some time with you in Kigutu, but um, more importantly, have enjoyed more recently sitting in on the uh, clinical committee meeting the gathering of some really exciting people who are driving this project. And uh, Dave, I, I just congratulate you. I mean, Thomas McIntyre just does a tremendous job. Uh, Eva's on that, Ian Mountjoy is on it, Catherine jumps in. And it's really humbling for me as a physician. I mean, I go to the hospital day in, day out, and I just take for granted everything around me. And my experience sitting on this committee has just changed my whole perspective because I'm starting to notice the incredible amount of detail and the level that so much goes into building a hospital and then building the supportive infrastructure. And Teresa, you've done it. It's so fun to watch your, your mind in action as you are putting together all the pieces for the clinical sides of it and making, bringing all the, the numerous different people who are gonna be very important in this process. Um, that's kind of a long-winded way of saying congratulations and, and you know, thanks for letting me be a part of it. And I, I couldn't be more excited to, be, to come over there when this is open and really dive in there. Um, you, Julia, you, ask, you actually asked my question, but I wanna support it because I am hopeful, I am hopeful that President Evarista is gonna change Burundi in ways and make it much more like Rwanda and that we are, the timing is really ideal for the opening of VHW and to bring then a, a, a larger, basically infrastructure throughout the country that we will really be the marquee project for and then to scale it. So I think the timing couldn't be better and, and maybe you could comment on that, Dale. And then my final and most important question, you have a tremendous group of people on this Zoom today. I'm really impressed with the turnout and Wade and Eva, Dale, what can you give us for homework? What can we all do to help you? Wade? <laughs> yeah, sure, I'll take that one. I mean, I think we were talking about what should the takeaways be from these calls, like, you know, everybody's taking an hour out of their time. I think what Deo said and what, what, what Ron and Teresa both said, you know, Burundi is a tough environment and we don't have everything figured out. We, we don't have good pay structures figured out to, 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 to get the community involved and how to be part of this as well. So, you know, if there's people we should be talking to, if there's 
Um, organizations that are figuring this out are a little farther ahead of than us. If there's people that you think that want to be part of this organization, I think you know we, we've always found, and Fred, you're a great example of this, that involvement leads to commitment. And so I think there's a lot of areas where people can, can really dive in and be part of this. There's clinical committees, there's interior design committees, there's um, fundraising committees. Um, and so you know, I think if you're sitting there saying, I love this project, I've, I've supported it, I'd like to do more, please email me. I can, we can find ways for you to get engaged. I think for us, you know, from where I sit, you know, we're very close to finishing the fundraising part of this. I think we need, we need a couple more friends to help us get over the line. Um, I think if you're asking Teresa, there are some JDs that are posted on the website. We need help finding people, you know, good candidates. Um, you know, if you're talking to Deo, we're looking at solving some really difficult problems that are really difficult to figure out housing, pay structures, um, equitable salaries, things like that, that I think we're wrestling with. So I think with us, I think we're, 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 we try to be transparent and say, yes, we're making a lot of progress, but there's still a lot that we're, we're confronting that frankly is really hard because not a lot of people have done this before. Um, and so, you know, I, I hope that's a good answer, but they, if there's other things you can yeah, in a really few words, you, you, you really said it all, Wade, and, um, you know, we, as I said, it's a, it's a really a country that has been uh, isolated uh, alone for so long, and we need a friend. So if each one of you here can bring new friends, two, three, five friends, that will be a nice exponential growth, because even advocacy, really, you know, there's a country called Burundi. You know, we don't need it to have another person showing up at JFK and showing up, you know, and a passport. And then where is that? What what which which country is that? Are you it's not Burma? This was a question I was asked at the airport. <laughs> it's uh, yes, there's a country called Burundi, and um, uh, there are people who really would like to make a huge difference if they, you know, they are given the opportunity to have a hope in the future. And that is, uh, you know, one of these uh, acts of compassion that, you know, we are all capable of, uh, you know, really doing to touch someone's life. So, yeah, you know, more friends, more friends. Teresa, I think you have uh, something to say here. Yeah. So, I, I mean, Fred, I want to, to, to give some very specifics about areas where um, we could really use some support. And then if there are people on the call who, who have some expertise around there, that would be, that would be fabulous. So um, the, the first is really around mental health. And so, you know, we have, as Dale has talked about the, the trauma that has happened in war and all of those things that have happened in Burundi, there's this huge um, problem with um, mental health issues um, and um, intergenerational trauma. So anybody who has expertise around that, particularly around organizational change within the context of um, trauma or trauma-informed um, uh, um, change um, or at an organizational level, as well as um, folks who may have specific interest in community-based um, mental health and you know, helping us to evaluate the models that we have now and thinking about how we might be able to um, map out the rest of Southern Burundi and scale up or create a program that could then be used in conjunction with the Ministry of Health to really address um, the problem of mental health. Um, the second thing would be you know, expertise around simulation training. Um, and uh, that's not my, I have been training people for a long time, but that's not my area of expertise and really being able to help us to set up a sim lab, um, get the equipment, we have the space, um, do the training. That would be something that would be very specific. Um, Wade has also already talked about recruitment. And then the other piece um, for me is uh, just thinking about, um, having almost like a medical advisory board um, that could um, be people with specific knowledge around running hospitals and systems and operations um, who could you know, be an advisory board to the chief medical officer, the chief nursing officer and the, and the hospital operations person, people who have regional experience. So those are, I think, three very specific asks from, from my side. Thanks. Thank you. You know, I, I think that's really helpful and those are great answers. And I think this is not a hard project to get really excited about. 
on, on various levels. Most of all, I think the, the local impact is gonna be phenomenal. I mean, I think anyone who goes there sees that. But then the thing that gets me equally as excited is I think this is something that's really scalable. And it's gonna be a marquee project that's really kind of demonstrate that this can be done. It can be done well with good people, really committed people and passionate. And that then it can have even a, dram a more dramatic, and I would even go so far as to say global or trans-Africa impact. And those are the kind of things that those of us such as myself who have, have a busy schedule and do a lot of things and are trying to figure out how to, how to allocate my time, get excited about. I love the concept of super high quality that's really scalable. So congratulations to you guys, really exciting. Thank, Thank you, Brad. Thank you. I think we might have time for one more question. If anybody has one, if getting close to the end of the hour. Thank you guys for joining again. Um, if not, I think we, we, we look to do this probably not, maybe not on a monthly basis, but maybe every other month to keep this group updated and others updated. Um, one of the things you can do is bring a friend next time. I think like Fred said, this is an easy project to get excited about, but uh, no one really wakes up thinking about Burundi. So, you know, please, you know, be an ambassador for us and, and help spread the word. Um, we definitely need some more people to help come join this project and uh, get us to where we need to be. Um, if that's it, uh, thank you all for joining. Um, there is a recording of this if anybody's interested, um, if you want to share it with other people. Um, if there's anything else, um, I can be reached very easily. I think most of you know how to reach out to me or Dea or Teresa, uh, Ron. Um, but uh, thank you guys very much. We look forward to keeping you updated and uh, moving this along. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye. bye.